<laughs> What's up, brother? It's all you, my man. It's all you. I expect some good traffic and good insults <laughs> on the thread, on the WhatsApp well, thread this weekend with Brady and my homeboy and everybody else. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I wanted to start on how we met through one Thomas Wayne Hovass on an email string. And I knew we were going to be friends forever, uh, about a weekend uh, or so. Somehow you got a uh, photo of my business headshot and said, why do I think of a milk dud when I see this picture? And I fell out because I barely even knew you. I say, oh yeah, this this is gonna make a lot of sense. This is this is radical candor. There's a new book out, or it's not new. It's a couple of years ago. Radical candor. Uh -huh. Many of the many of the friends that we have, that we are, the hovasses of the world, my brother, right. others, have been practicing radical candor for decades, not for years. We're, <laughs> we're ahead of our time. So yeah. yeah, so we met through Tom, but that was because you were playing pro ball. Over. Talk a little bit about your balling career. So I had a short and non-illustrious career, BA. I was lucky enough to go from San Diego to Stanford. I was lucky enough to graduate from Stanford. Uh, had a cup of coffee three years in the NBA, Atlanta, Orlando, and Dallas. Really a fulfillment of a childhood dream that I could not have imagined. There are lots of times when you think and ideate on some ideas. And then very rarely, when you get there, it is more significant to you than you could have ever imagined. Right. That was my time in the NBA. I was one of thousands of six, eight, 235, 40 pound guys that could run and jump, but I did not have any you know, discernible talent above <laughs> being able to do just that. The but kids now are just so good and they, shoot so well they run so fast oh, and these, unbelievable. it's it's a uh, I, I was i recognized my own athletic mortality <laughs> when i got there and dominique was a, a teammate Shaq was a teammate you recognize that some folks have been touched on the shoulder by god to do this thing better right. than other mortals so these are the enhanced <laughs> versions of us and uh, plenty of great stories and uh I do appreciate it. Travel the world. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So after that, after that, um, teams in Europe were basically taking those players like me that were on a team on the fringe, didn't have multiple year contracts in the NBA, and offering us multiple year contracts in Europe. So I did that for many years. And be a, I'll be honest, in my 20s, living in Barcelona or Madrid or, you know, uh, France, yeah. lots of fun, no responsibility because it was just me and you got a duffel bag full of, you know, sweats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, finally ending up, uh, my agent told me about a deal in, in Japan. And that's where we met our, our mutual friend, Tom, and we've been uh, uh, best friends ever since. You know what's funny is uh, Stanford, we may not talked about this, Stanford was recruiting me, but you had a dude on your team that was a bad boy named Todd Lichtig, and I would have never made the, saw the court if I had gone to Stanford. So, so things so turned out wait, wait, for wait. the right reasons, you know what I mean? And, and uh, Todd and I were the same year, so I saw every dribble of every practice and every game. I saw every weight that he lifted. I saw every time we were on the, on the track. Uh, B, I love you. I love you to death. The, he was a bad dude, boy. Hey, man. This dude, this dude was something special. And he's, in my mind, um, the best Stanford basketball player in our history. Other wow. folks have had greater professional careers. Uh -huh. and uh, But he is, he, he, he's the best I've ever seen at Stanford. Just like you said earlier, your mortality. I knew – my limitations, and I, want, I wanted to play, and you know what? It turned out for the better. Uh, so the interesting story that uh, you've told before that I, I love is just, uh, and I've talked about it from my end about um, access and how my father yeah. snuck into this all-white neighborhood, and by the time they found out, it was too late. And I don't even think you know, he was playing for the San Diego Chargers, um, minor league squad let's call it that yeah, yeah. But if he hadn't done that 
I wouldn't have the access and, and, and you've used the word trajectory. So yeah. talk about your grandfather and father and how that all got you on the right path, I guess. Sure. So going back to my grandfather, my father's father, who in a great migration from Georgia up to Ohio, abject poverty, multiple blue collar jobs, while my grandmother was a domestic and she was cleaning people's houses. When my grandfather was in high school, he was probably the best high school player, you know, top 10 high school players in the US, but not a lot of black kids were going to college and it wasn't like it is now where the college sports is a multi-billion dollar business. Right. Their team goes to the national championship and it, the game is played in Florida, in, um, in uh, Jacksonville. He, fl he drives down with the team through the South in 1939, has to sit on the top of the bus because he is not allowed in the stadium to see his team lose the national championship game. So when I was a kid at BA, he told us that story. It wasn't with any bitterness or with any animosity. It was, I think, to try to strengthen our resolve to understand upon whom shoulder we stand on. Right. So now, so now he's denied his opportunity to even go to college. Here comes his son, my father, when he's a self-professed 13-year-old fat kid, as my father used to call himself. Right. He, he is a freshman in high school. I'm sorry, he's 14. And he comes home and he says, Dad, I made, made the freshman team in football. And my grandfather looks at him like, what's the freshman team? Why aren't you <laughs> on varsity? He said, well, I've never, I've never played football before. He said, okay, every day after school, keep your pads on, come to this house, and I'm gonna show you how to play football. And at that time, so that my grandfather makes him late 30s, and my father, 14. Uh, my grandmother used to tell this story. She would sit in the bay windows of our house, of their house on 1010 Prospect Avenue in Toledo, Ohio, and watch this late 30s man, my grandfather, annihilate this child 14. who is my father. You know, so that's 1956, 1957, 1958, BA. It's, it's barely leather on the helmets. Right. So my grandfather would say, get in a stance. Okay, come off the line. Pow. Head slap. <laughs> Everything. So now my grandmother, who is the, if anybody has ever made it to heaven, it's my, it's my grandmother. Uh -huh. she, she is in her bay window praying for her baby boy not to be destroyed by her husband. <laughs> but what I recognize, two things out of that story. One, my father became Ernie Wright in the backyard, in the mud, in the blood, by never quitting. He never quit. He was outmatched in every physical, mental uh, way, uh, obviously for my grandfather. And also my grandfather injected into my father the will to be great. So now you go from one, uh, generation away from sharecropping to some poverty in Toledo, Ohio, to now my father is considered one of the greatest chargers that ever played. And he did it with dignity. He did it with authority. And by my father continuing to put his hands in the mud in the backyard, he changed the trajectory of every right that came after him. Now, all my brothers and sisters, all my nieces and nephews, graduated from great colleges, advanced degrees. Might have, in fact, I'm the only one that doesn't really have an advanced degree. I'm the, you know, I'm, the I'm, I'm the black sheep in the family <laughs> because, uh, you know, I dropped out of business school to, to join, join Qualcomm. But when my reserves are low in terms of energy and getting up to go to the work and attack the day, I think about my grandfather, how, access was denied to him. He then handed the baton to my father 
my father took it and so that we had a different purview, a different altitude from which to see these great universities and to have these great friends. My responsibility is I have that baton in my hand and I have a responsibility to my daughters as well as to a, a debt that I will never be able to pay to all the ancestors that came before me. So sorry for the long answer, but no, no, that, that it, was perfect. It gets really personal. It gets really personal with me on that one, BA. No, no, no. It's a great answer, and I think one of the things that's hitting a lot of my friends who are white, what when I tell them, uh, and this is going to be you and anybody within a year of us, we are the first generation of black men in this country who were born after essentially American apartheid. Yes, and. And, and if it wasn't be, because of our fathers, your father made it to the pros because of his hard work and, and got you out to San Diego. And my father just snuck into this neighborhood because he found an ally. So yeah. that's a, a point I'd love to try to get across to people that we're not that far removed. But, this is one generation. This is yeah. one generation from, I'm 53, I think we're the same age. Yep. And so you think about civil rights and then busing and housing laws in the seventies, that is one generation and one generation of progress. We as African-American people have been enslaved on this land longer than we have been free. Yeah. Going yeah. back to 1619. Yeah. And it, now, now it seems like it's at the point where you can't just say, I'm not racist. Now you gotta be anti-racist. <laughs> you gotta be proactive. I mean, I'm talking everybody, right? I think, I think it goes even further, BA. It's in the 70s and 80s, there were quiet areas of conversation you just simply didn't have. You didn't talk about religion, you didn't talk about race, you didn't talk about somebody's money. Politics. Politics, you left those things in closets around people's respective houses. This platform that you're doing, these responsibilities that we have, whatever voice, whatever audience that I have, it almost demands a higher level of activity and that activity has got to be uh, uh, tied to accuracy. So not only anti-racist, of course, the friends and the majority males that uh, uh, we hang out with, they're not racist. They do not see themselves. I would say the vast 90% of the folks in the United States don't see themselves. But are you actively and aggressively anti-racist? Are you actively and aggressively anti-misogyny? Are you actively and aggressively anti-homophobic? Are you anti and anti-aggressively anti-Semitic? So the, right. the, the pivot now is not passivity and innocent until proven guilty. It is to defend our brothers and sisters in arm who are in need right now. This yeah. is the time, this is our clarion call for all of us uh, that call ourselves educated, proud black men in this country to have these long form adult conversations with our friends and our allies. We don't have to agree on everything. We do have to agree on some common sense approaches to how we get out of this. Yeah, and one of the big things for me um, that came out of Floyd was I had to step up my game and start digging in the books because we both yeah, kind of went yeah. to the same kinds of schools. Yeah. And what we learned in school is not American history. So I've been, you know, just voraciously reading books about this country, racism, because I needed to have accuracy with my friends, especially my white friends who were asking me these questions. And yeah. you know what? I didn't have answers. So I was like, I got to get to work. Yeah, and that's been good. It has allowed me to refresh some of my reading. I remember in uh, freshman year of college, we had a civics course. The required reading was 10 or 12 books. It was, you know, Socrates and Nietzsche. It was also Mein Kampf. It was also a letter from a Birmingham jail. I believe it was autobiography of Malcolm X, all very controversial, all over the place. Um, books and topics the reading of the book was fantastic it was then getting back into class into lab and having 24 28 of the brightest minds in the world then debate the nuances of that that part right. 
gave us a common platform, a common background upon which we could move through a text and through the idea. Unfortunately, the disinformation campaign that has happened in cable news is that nobody has a rudder, nobody has a base of what is right or wrong. I would like us in our, you know, our friends, so your network multiplied by my network, multiplied by Tom's network and a couple others, you know, consistently lean into, you're entitled to your own opinion, you're not entitled to your own set of facts. Amen. <laughs> so, Amen. And Amen. so I, I, I have incredible patience for something, but then the anti-vaxxers, the flat earthers, the uh, Holocaust deniers, the um, um, yeah, deniers of slavery and other things, they are, let's call them what they are, bat shit crazy BAs, <laughs> whether black, brown, or whatever. Let's let's agree to have a gravity-based conversation. And the gravity is off of facts. Yeah. Simple <laughs> facts, not that tough. So um, I wanted to get to your career because you have a new gig coming, but where'd you yeah. start after hoops? And After, uh, while I was still playing basketball, in the summer, I was going to business school in San Diego. I was trying, you know, I've been playing for eight, nine, 10 years, been making you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars back in the uh, late 90s. That was good money. I mean, hell, it's good money right now, too, but it was good. I wanted to prepare myself for my next chapter. And what I found, BA, is that I had been gone playing basketball for 10 years. My classmates from Stanford had started the yahoos and they're doing you know the they're making moves yeah in the, in the corporate arena and i had to catch up and so i thought yeah. hmm, let's do this i by happenstance get a chance to meet paul jacobs who was the heir apparent and the son of erwin jacobs paul eventually became chairman ceo he's still a mentor he's still a friend today uh he came and spoke to this entrepreneurial breakfast i asked him after um a few questions he said we're always looking for smart folks from at, at qualcomm let me know when you graduate from business school <laughs> and so ba uh i my dirty little secret is i never graduated from business school i dropped out i handed uh paul my resume which was pretty much as blank <laughs> white sheet paper you've been blown <laughs> for 10 years <laughs> uh i have a degree in qualitative economics and I will work my ass off for you, sir. So Paul, Peggy Johnson, a few other mentors in San Diego took a chance on me when they absolutely didn't have to. And then what they did as the best coaches and mentors do, they held me accountable all throughout my career. It, it was not a tokenism like we need to hire a black person or we need to hire a tall person. Right. It was, we see something in this kid, let's see if we can um, extract the most value out of him for the benefit of our shareholders and to that i will never be able to repay that personal and professional debt of learning from the best and so i my mother from time to time asked me about hey, you ever think you'll go back to business school it's like to do what i learned from erwin jacobs paul, paul jacobs and peggy johnson and altman and dave vigil and you know there's a there's a literally a wireless hall of fame list of friend, friends and mentors that I have, um, I don't think I need to go back to business school. I just need to execute what they instilled in me. No question. And then after Qualcomm? So I was in Qualcomm, my hometown, San Diego, for 14 years. I got an offer from Intel, but I couldn't refuse. So we took our talents, not to South Beach, but back to the Bay Area. My oldest daughter was finishing her undergraduate at Stanford there, and then she did her uh stanford law school there so being back physically more approximately you know closer to her was great and we did 5g business development around the world i got a text one day from the ceo the ceo and i were not close we were close enough because he recruited me right he, he said um 
I got an idea. Why don't you come see me? I was like, oh my God, what did I do? I'm thinking about, like, did I? <laughs> principal's did I, office. <laughs> yeah, I'm funded the principal's office. He said, we bought a couple companies and I'm thinking about buying a few more. Uh, we want you to run global business development for this company, this subsidiary, which was Intel Sports. I said, yes, sir. You didn't have to ask me. Your name is on the check. So you didn't, technically didn't have to ask me. I appreciate it that you we did. appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. And so we did that for three years and made some great contacts. And that was my entree back into my former world. That's back writing deals with NBA and the teams, the league office and the teams, the NFL league office and the teams. We did 50 some odd deals around the world, of which I'm very proud of. And then just basically about a year ago, I started getting itchy as I wanted to kind of run my own shop. BA. I felt like all this was preparing me for something. I didn't know what that something was. I didn't know if that something was stay at Intel, go to another multinational or take a risk. Uh, and basically the startup mode is what we're doing now. So what we're doing now is the company is C360 Technologies. You will probably recognize us for pylon cams and a couple other immersive media creation views, uh, basketball games, it, we work with the NHL, NASCAR. Um, that's what we do now. We have a couple of things up our sleeves as we roll into act two of our act three act play. And business has been great. And BA, the company is headquartered in P Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I uh, know. When <laughs> I saw that, I'm like, this can't be. I said, that's why I'm splitting time because both of us can't be in uh, Pennsylvania. We just can't have that. Uh, not, 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 not right this second, but as soon as as soon as uh, Dr. Fauci comes in and, and puts the vaccination in my arm, I'm going to go set up You'll some groups. And, uh, You'll love Pittsburgh. Some time in Pitt so Pittsburgh is our headquarters. We have investment in Pittsburgh. We have investment from Philadelphia. We have some investment from Boeing, like Horizon X, their um, VC arm. And there's a ton of partners that we have in that Eastern seaboard. So I look forward to this summer getting out there and spending a significant time with uh, with our team. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to it too. Uh, um, so will you guys have anything going on with the Super Bowl? Yeah, so we have some engineering proof of concepts and working with Verizon. Um, what I'll do is I'll feed you once and if they go to air, I'll send you so your readers or, or your listeners can be up to date on what we do. Uh, I don't want to jinx anything, but there are lots of irons in the fires right now. And so my toes and fingers are crossed. But again, our partners are the broadcasters, our ESPN, Fox, CBS and others. Verizon, et cetera. And so working in that ecosystem, I call that immersive media economy. Okay. We're right in the middle of that. We're getting our you know, fair share of opportunity and time to win sockets. And then as an African-American CEO, we're getting you know, plenty of looks for uh, you know, our raise of our next round, which will happen in, in probably two months. Uh, we love the position that we're sitting in right now, and we need to take uh, full advantage of the opportunities. Okay, so the final thing is we're going to come full circle because we talked about how our fathers gave us access. Yeah. And I wanted to talk about your charity and how you give them yeah. back. So when we first moved to San Diego, we lived um, over by a little bit south of San Diego State. Anybody that's lived in San Diego knows what I'm talking about. At the time, it was this mixed, affluent, middle-class neighborhood. It was pretty nice. My father, his last year with the Chargers was 1973, and he was the highest paid, fourth highest paid offensive lineman. He made $78,000 a year. He thought, yeah, he thought he was never going to have to work again in his life. <laughs> so that year, 73, we moved from a mixed neighborhood to an all-white neighborhood. And so... We were the Jeffersons, but my father didn't have a dry cleaning business. <laughs> and so now what happened is that being the first, being the only, being one of the few kids of color in your class, on your team, on your, you know, uh, in your community, yeah. there's a higher expectation of excellence required because you will mess it up for everybody else. Now, coming back to your question, 
we used to go to this little, you know, par three course where we used to live in San Diego in Kalina Park. And it was great. It was fun. I learned to play golf there with my father. My brother and I would come uh, go all the time. What my father did in 1994 was basically talk to the city and say, okay, you have let this go. Grant it to me. I will build a haven. I will build a talent factory here. I will build a sanctuary for kids of all colors to come and learn the game of golf. Yes, that's moderately important, but be taught life skills as a result of the, you know, 501c that I can build around it. That became Pro Kids Golf Academy and Learning Center. That is the model upon which First Tee was built. And so now most folks are more familiar with the First Tee of whatever city that you're in. It's an international success. We were and are the flagship for the First Tee, the First Tee of San Diego, First Tee of Oceanside. But we are the favorite son <laughs> and we were the, the creators of this. If this was you know, McDonald's, we would have charged a royalty, but it's not. It's a 501c3 world. And so now, right. hey, listen to this. In this community that supposedly has all these failure factories in terms of junior high schools and high schools, our kids come through the program. We give them life skills. We give them support. We give them college scholarships for those who do extraordinarily well. Stanford, Ivy League schools, uh, medical school, business school, We've given away two and a half million dollars worth of scholarships in the last uh, you know, 20 years. And these kids are the movers and shakers of the ecosystem. This is, remember when Bush said no child left behind? These were the communities that children were being left behind. And my father had the audacity to use his political clout and his fiscal kind of network to ask folks to you know, generate the dollars that we needed to to, uh, to run the facility and to benefit these kids. So he was not a deity at all. He, in his later stages in life, tried to give back in a meaningful way. And I didn't always like him, but I always loved him. And I'm so happy that I got 39 years of my life to spend with that man, to see that you have to set your sight line above what is right in front of you and build something that is a, a legacy that will be bigger than you when you're gone. That's the audacity that our fathers, you know, these are basically poor black kids coming up in the 50s to dream that big. We only have the same responsibility to dream as big for them. Uh, no. Well said, and I think that's a strong way to end. I appreciate you, brother. Always Mission good to meet you. And uh, tell the family I said hello. That beautiful mom of yours. Oh, my God. 